If you've read or listened to much Stoic literature, you'll have heard of Epicurus and Epicureanism, usually in a negative light. In this video, I want to explain as clearly as possible what Epicureanism is, consider whether it's at odds with Stoicism, and give some suggestions on how to productively view it from a Stoic perspective. Epicureanism is technically a hedonistic philosophy. It teaches that the highest good is pleasure, but pleasure achieved through freedom from pain and tranquility of mind, rather than through the types of sensual desires that we commonly associate with hedonism. When, therefore, we maintain that pleasure is the end, we do not mean the pleasures of profligates and those that consist in sensuality, as is supposed by some who are either ignorant or disagree with us or do not understand, but freedom from pain in the body and from trouble in the mind. In practice, therefore, a true Epicurean life usually entails self-discipline, simple living and the maintenance of strong friendships. Look up the word Epicurean in the dictionary, however, and you'll see its modern usage is almost the exact opposite. Just like Stoicism, its colloquial meaning has drifted over the millennia. However, unlike Stoicism, this drift is largely the result of a deliberate mischaracterization by early scholars. Before diving into the weeds of the philosophy, let's do a high-level comparison of both Stoicism and Epicureanism. For those of you with short attention spans, this is the TLDR version. The Virtues In the eyes of Epicureanism, the virtues are only good insofar as they help you attain pleasure and happiness, but they are not good in and of themselves. To the Stoics, the virtues are the sole goods, specifically wisdom, justice, fortitude and temperance. They are their own rewards, and the fact that they tend to lead to a happy life is an incidental benefit. Pleasure, meaning comfort, wealth and lack of pain. In the eyes of Epicureanism, pleasure is the highest good. It is what we should seek for a happy life. True pleasure is achieved through the elimination of pain and fear. To that end, it is characterised by sufficient food, a comfortable dwelling, peaceful relationships, close friends and temperance. To the Stoics, pleasure, wealth and lack of pains are preferred indifference. It's better to have them than not, but a good life can be led without them. They sometimes also argue we need to encounter hardships in life to test and strengthen ourselves, as well as to practice our virtues. The Gods To Epicureans, Maybe they exist, but they are indifferent to us. Do not fear them, as fear disrupts tranquillity. To the Stoics, they exist and impact our lives. Nature is designed by Zeus, therefore some degree of divine providence exists. We are like a little appendage of Zeus, and who is an appendage to question the plans of the whole body? Superstition, Magic and Divination to the Epicureans, these are false. They are also sources of fear, and since fear disrupts our happiness, they should be actively avoided. The Stoics agreed that these were false. On a cursory glance, then, Epicureanism places pleasure above virtue, and Stoicism does the opposite. And Epicureanism ignores God and religion, while Stoicism teaches that a divine creator continues to impact the world and should be revered. Given these pretty fundamental differences, it's easy to see where the animosity comes from. Now, if all you want is to understand the difference, then you can stop right here. But if you wish to understand why Epicureanism has been so maligned, and what it can still teach us, then listen on as we take a deeper look at its history and teachings. Stranger, you would do good to stay a while, for here the highest good is pleasure. First, to the history. Epicurus was born in 341 BC, grew up on the Greek island of Samos, and studied under a follower of Democritus. He did his military service at 18, spent a number of years travelling, and then began teaching philosophy in Mytilene at around the age of 30. In 306 BC, he returned to Athens and founded what came to be known as his Garden, a place of recluse where he taught and lived out his philosophy with close friends and students. It is above the entrance to this garden that the famous quote referenced by Seneca is said to have hung. 
During Epicurus's life, Epicureanism and Stoicism both grew in popularity and became dominant philosophies of the age. Epicureanism reached its height around 70 BC, and while popular in Rome, it did draw more criticism than Stoicism due to its teachings being seen to run counter to the Roman ideal of the manly virtues. Later it came under sustained attack from Christian scholars due to its heretical views on God and the soul, which could not be reconciled with Christianity. Epikoros is even the Jewish term for heretic used in the Mishnah, part of the Oral Torah composed between 200 and 220 AD, and Epicurus and all his followers make an appearance in Dante's Inferno, in the sixth level of hell, the one reserved for heretics. Their cemetery have upon this side, with Epicurus all his followers, who, with the body, mortal make the soul. By the early Middle Ages, Epicureanism had faded completely, with Epicurus being considered a patron of drunkards, whoremongers and gluttons. It wasn't until the 15th century that some of his texts resurfaced, and not until the 17th century that Enlightenment thinkers began to take an active interest in reviving his ideas. Here's Thomas Jefferson writing to William Short in 1819. As you say of yourself, I too am an Epicurean. I consider the genuine, not the imputed, doctrines of Epicurus as containing everything rational in moral philosophy which Greece and Rome have left us. In contrast, Stoicism was broadly embraced by Christianity, and remained in Europe to some degree until its modern-day revival. What about Epicurus's other works? It bears mentioning that, philosophy aside, Epicurus also took a wide interest in the study of science and nature in general. Whilst living in his garden, he is said, by Diogenes, to have written some 300 treatises on topics ranging from the theory of knowledge to physics, astronomy and language. As an example, a few of the things he wrote about were the atom, that the universe is infinite, that the universe is not completely deterministic at the atomic scale, but contains elements of uncertainty and probability, referred to as swerve by Epicurus, that platonic forms were nonsense, and that properties like sweetness or colour were not present in individual atoms, but were emergent properties as atoms came together how the mind is a physical organ, and that our spirit is destroyed at death. The idea of a social contract as a basis of justice. The formulation of the problem of evil argument, that is, evil exists either because God is unwilling to stop it, is unable to stop it, or doesn't exist. References to the idea of the God of the gaps arguments, that things like lightning and earthquakes were not signs of the gods, but rather naturally occurring events, explainable if we simply study the natural world enough, and that we could, through the study of science, emancipate ourselves from irrational fears and even develop a science of happiness. In a sense, Epicurus was akin to an early humanist or even new atheist in his outlook, and Epicureanism as a philosophy finds most followers among such circles today. But now let's take a deeper look at Epicurean philosophy. Epicureanism holds pleasure as its highest good, and Epicurus separated pleasure into two sorts, those that were active and those that were static. An active or kinetic pleasure is felt when one is in the process of performing an action, such as satisfying a desire or removing a pain, for example eating. But after you finish eating, you will be in a state of contentment, you will feel satiated and satisfied. This static state Epicurus referred to as a catastomatic pleasure. Epicurus appreciated the kinetic pleasures, but is said to have valued the catastomatic sort more. To him, achieving an absence of pain and a lack of disturbance of mind was what led to true happiness. The magnitude of pleasure reaches its limit in the removal of all pain. Among pleasure and pain, Epicurus also differentiated between the physical and the mental. Physical pleasures and pains concern only the present, whereas mental pleasures and pains also encompass the past, think fond memories or regret over past mistakes, and the future, that is to say confidence or fear about what will occur. Now catastomatic pleasures come in both physical and mental forms. 
physically when free from physical disturbances such as hunger, thirst or ill health, and mentally when free from negative thoughts such as fear and worry. Achieving freedom from physical disturbance was referred to as aponia, and achieving freedom from mental disturbance was referred to as ataraxia. Since catastomatic pleasures require the satisfying of desires and alleviating of fears, Epicurus set about defining and categorizing the types of desire we experience. He divided them into three groups, natural and necessary, natural and unnecessary, unnatural and unnecessary, or the vain desires. He said we should pursue the first, be open to but cautious of the second, and avoid completely the third. Natural and necessary desires are things such as food, water, and human company. These are difficult to eliminate, but easily satisfied and bring great pleasure when they are. What's more, they are usually necessary for life, or at least for a happy life. For this reason, we should always try to fulfill these desires, as it is only in satisfying them that we reach aponia. Natural and unnecessary desires are things like luxurious food, fine clothes or sex. These are not necessary for life and also not always easy to satisfy. They are kinetically pleasurable, however they present a catastomatic risk, in that the more we indulge in them, the more of a habit we build around consuming them. Then, should they ever become unavailable, we risk losing our tranquility due to an unfulfilled, unnecessary desire. Ultimately, Epicurus's advice is to be open to them, but to definitely avoid becoming accustomed to them. Incidentally, this is similar to the Stoic position, which generally emphasizes simple living, but also says not to be afraid of using luxuries when they happen to be available. Finally, the unnatural and unnecessary desires are things like power, wealth, and fame. These are the vain desires, not natural to human beings, but conditioned into us by society. They are unnecessary and difficult to satisfy because they have no natural limit. For example, if one chases after power, no amount of power will ever be enough, as it's always possible to get more. Further, even as we achieve them, we gain with them not only the fear of losing what we have gained, which manifests itself as mental pain, but also the anger and animosity of those around us who now envy our position. As such, they are unnecessary, insatiable, and lead to pain and fear if achieved. Consequently, they are to be utterly avoided. If you live according to nature, you will never be poor. If you live according to opinion, you will never be rich. Or, in the words of Seneca, Nature's wants are slight, the demands of opinion are boundless. Following these definitions, it can be tempting to think of Epicurus as an ascetic, someone who believes in the denouncement of all worldly possessions in favour of spiritual goals, but he was not quite that extreme. There is also a limit in simple living, and he who fails to understand this falls into an error as great as that of the man who gives way to extravagance. Epicurus's position revolved around minimizing sources of pain, not in eliminating all sources of pleasure or all physical possessions. If eliminating something caused more pain than it alleviated, what was the point? Further, he held that the majority of all kinetic pleasure was achieved in the process of satisfying our most basic needs, and luxuries, while pleasant, brought minimal added value. To understand this, imagine quenching your thirst with water on a hot day, and then imagine quenching it with any other drink of your choice. It is the quenching that brings the lion's share of the pleasure, and the flavour of the liquid really just adds variety, moving the pleasure sideways, so to speak, rather than greatly increasing it. I quoted earlier this famous phrase that hung above the entrance to Epicurus's garden. Consider now Seneca's commentary on that garden. The caretaker of that abode, a friendly host, will be ready for you. He will welcome you with barley meal and serve you water, also in abundance, with these words. Have you not been well entertained? This garden does not whet your appetite, but quenches it. Nor does it make you more thirsty with every drink, it slakes the thirst with a natural cure, a cure that requires no fee. It is with this type of pleasure that I have grown old. 
The true meaning, then, is that the aim of the garden was to quench your appetite with simple fare, and put a stop to your unnecessary desires. It is this that brings about Epicurus's highest good of lasting pleasure. Consider for a moment that there are people who pride themselves on their refinement of taste, and say things like, I only accept the best in life. To Epicurus this was backwards. You experience pain when you can't satisfy what you want, so to deliberately train yourself to want refined things is simply setting yourself up for pain. Teach yourself instead to take pleasure and joy in simple things, and you will always be happy. This thought is echoed in Stoicism with Epictetus's words, I do not need luxuries. But you, even if you acquire many possessions, need still others, and, whether you will or not, are more poverty-stricken than I am. Satisfying our natural desires alone is not enough to reach ataraxia and a tranquil mind. For this, we must remove all mental anguish and worry. To this end, Epicurus taught that we must not fear death or the gods. Death, because we would not be conscious of it when it happened, and the gods, because it was unlikely that they paid any attention to us. Death is nothing to us. When we exist, death is not, and when death exists, we are not. All sensation and consciousness ends with death, and therefore in death there is neither pleasure nor pain. The fear of death arises from the belief that in death there is awareness. His argument around death is essentially identical to that of the Stoics, and indeed many other philosophies. His argument when it came to the gods, however, was quite different. He held that either they lived in utter blessedness, completely free from care, or that they cared greatly about human affairs and so fretted over our actions. In such a case, they were effectively in a state of fear. He couldn't believe they existed in a state of fear, so chose to believe they instead ignored us. As such, he said we need not concern ourselves with them, and therefore not fear them either. The Roman poet Lucretius proudly referred to Epicurus as the destroyer of religion. To me, this has some eerie foreshadowing of Nietzsche's lament that God is dead, which he made some two thousand years later, funnily enough, as Epicureanism was making a revival. I want also to briefly touch on the Epicurean approach to society, because there is a glaring difference with Stoicism. Epicurus practiced a principle of lathebiosas, which meant to live in obscurity, or to not draw attention to oneself. Meaning, one should in general withdraw from taking an active role in society, and certainly not engage in politics, as such things are likely only to perturb us. Done on an individual level, this is sustainable. One can live a productive and happy life, surrounded by friends and family, and away from society at large. However, at a societal level, the more people that practice this, the fewer people there are to take charge of the running of the state, resist barbarian invasions, and generally act for the public good. I guess you could say it relies on the world not coming to you. It's true that Stoics like Seneca talk frequently about retiring from public life and solely pursuing philosophy. However, the Stoics in general had a very strong notion of civic responsibility, duty, and even speaking truth to power, as they were driven not by outcomes but by virtuous behaviour itself. To them, tranquillity of mind came second. What's more, many Epicureans, including Epicurus himself, were also celibate since they considered the complications and pains that came with romantic relationships to outweigh the benefits. Taken together, these two issues lead to an interesting question as to whether Epicureanism is a sustainable philosophy for a society to practice at large, as it would likely lead to a decrease in birth rate, and, in antiquity at least, would leave a society more vulnerable to aggressive neighbours or the more proselytising sorts of philosophies and religions. Given that Western society today, at least the non-religious parts, probably leans toward an amalgamation of hedonism and epicureanism, it might be worth considering. So what does an epicurean life look like, and is it really opposed to stoicism? Having looked at the principles, we can say that epicureanism is technically hedonistic, however it is probably more useful to think of it as tranquillistic. 
Its principal goal is the elimination of pain, both physical and mental, and any other active form of pleasure-seeking comes second to that. A short summary of how to practice Epicureanism, then, would be focus on absolutely satisfying your natural needs, food, shelter, and friendship. Withdraw yourself from sources of pain and disquietude, such as fame, responsibility, and public office, and don't pursue wealth beyond what is required to fulfill your basic needs. Focus on bringing your friends into your life more. Work can be rewarding, provided you're not doing it for the money, but in order to work cooperatively with friends or do something you feel is innately valuable. Practice self-discipline. Pain and sacrifice should be chosen if they will yield greater tranquility later. And oft times we consider pains superior to pleasures when submission to the pains for a long time brings us, as a consequence, a greater pleasure. While therefore all pleasure because it is naturally akin to us is good, not all pleasure is choice-worthy, just as all pain is an evil, and yet not all pain is to be shunned. On a theoretical level, Epicureanism directly contradicts Stoicism in its belief that a divine creator does not impact the world, in its suggestion to withdraw from civic society, and in its elevating of pleasure over virtue. In this respect, they are clearly opposed. But on a purely practical level, both Epicureans and Stoics can lead similar lives. In order to live a true Epicurean life, one must actively practice temperance, courage, and fortitude in order to limit oneself to natural and necessary desires, fashion a life around that at the expense of all else, and maintain the self-discipline necessary to endure pain now for greater tranquility later. While virtue practiced under the motivation of reward might not sit well with Stoics, on a purely practical level the effect is the same, virtuous action. In Seneca's words, Epicurus was a brave man who practiced an effeminate philosophy. In my own opinion, however, Epicurus is really a brave man, even though he did wear long sleeves. Fortitude, energy, and readiness for battle are to be found among the Persians just as much as among men who have girded themselves up high. Ultimately, the degree to which they are in agreement depends on whether you are looking at theory or practice. In theory, they differ a lot. In practice, there is far more overlap. With this in mind, what practical takeaways can Stoics and Epicureans take from one another without sacrificing their core beliefs? This is my own custom. From the many things which I have read, I claim some one part for myself. A key takeaway for Stoics is to genuinely assess whether your true basic needs are met. Compared with antiquity, modern society is abundant, so for most people food and shelter are not a problem. However, what is far harder these days is community. Modern lifestyles can be severely isolating, and consequently many people miss out on the most fundamental human need of companionship. Ask yourself whether this applies to you, and if so, prioritise fixing it even at great material expense, because holding on to money and luxuries won't have nearly as much effect on your life as being in a position to frequently interact with your close friends. This courage to radically alter life to meet our natural and necessary desires is a large part of Epicureanism. Of all the means to ensure happiness throughout this whole life, by far the most important is the acquisition of friends. Secondly, and as an extension of that topic, we can seek to remove sources of pain before seeking out new sources of pleasure. An example of this would be choosing to replace a mundane object that is disrupting your life, such as a faulty washing machine, before acquiring a new luxury object like a flagship smartphone. In nearly all situations, the pain and disturbance caused by the faulty mundane object will outweigh the hedonic pleasure from the new luxury object. So spend time appraising what things in your life are causing you pain, and focus your resources on fixing them rather than seeking out new pleasures. Both of these suggestions seem obvious when stated, but really it's the prioritization of them over other concerns that is the true challenge. And what can Epicureans take from the Stoics without undermining their philosophy? 
First, I would suggest recognising that however much you seek to remove pain from the world, there will always be pain, and so learning to expect and endure it can be as valuable as trying to remove it. Second, I would suggest that if what matters is achieving a happy life, then sometimes just acting as if certain things are true can have better results than acting as if they are not. For example, many religions preach that God is always watching, and so we should always be good. An atheist or Epicurean would reject that. But a similar Stoic proposal is just to imagine from minute to minute that your hero or ideal self is watching over you, and let that affect your actions. Both of these are the same idea, but one is inherently religious, and the other is just a thought experiment. The point is that both encourage you to live up to your best self, which is surely something you should want. Even if they are not literally true, there can be value in acting as if they are, rather than rejecting them because they sound irrational. And finally, I'd recommend thinking of virtuous action as a rule of thumb for good outcomes. The world is extremely complicated, and often we can't rationally predict the result of our actions. Defaulting to virtuous action, even if painful in the moment, tends to lead to better results for everyone. All of these arguments are pragmatic, intended only as a suggestion on how both sides can achieve better practical results without needing to change underlying beliefs. This has been a very brief examination of Epicureanism. I've done my best to represent it concisely and accurately, and to compare it in both theoretical and practical terms with Stoicism. Hopefully it helps in not only understanding Epicureanism, but making better sense of Seneca and Epictetus's critiques of it. Personally, I found the process very interesting as a glimpse into the development of Western philosophy, how the seeds of later philosophies like utilitarianism, contractarianism and humanism were planted by Epicurus in 300 BC, but disappeared for thousands of years due to societal pressures, before finally sprouting again in the Enlightenment. It also made me consider to what degree our current society is inclined towards Epicureanism, and to what degree that is sustainable on a civilizational level, but that is a thought for another day. I welcome your thoughts and opinions in the comments section. Thank you for listening.